us do a quick review of the lymphoid tissues. Let's begin with this question. A public health department receives a report of three cases of pneumococcal pneumonia among the children of a home-based daycare center. All diagnoses were confirmed with blood cultures positive for a streptococcus pneumoniae. All affected children were less than 16 months of age. None of the affected children were previously vaccinated for pneumococcal vaccine as their parents were adamant against vaccination. History shows that the daycare serves 12 children and accepts no child under six months of age. Those who were affected with pneumonia have all been in contact with the rest of children. Only three of the healthy children had received their pneumococcal vaccines. Which of the following mechanisms most accurately explains the lack of clinical diagnosis of pneumonia in the exposed children who were not vaccinated? The immoral response by B cells in the white pulp of the spleen, phagocytosis by macrophages in the red pulp of the spleen, phagocytosis by the alveolar macrophages in the lung, T cell mediated clearance in the hilar lung lymph nodes, or maternally derived IgG antibodies interacting with the pathogens in the blood. As you might have noticed in my lectures, I always start, you know, dissecting the entire case scenario for you. But on the actual exam, it's always a good idea that when you deal with a case scenario or a vignette, to focus on the question part of the stem of the test item. In this case, the last three lines. So your first few seconds, I want you to look at the question part and then skim the five options. And this strategy will orient you about what to expect when you start looking at the entire case scenario. And at times, this strategy quite often saves time for you and also will direct you to where you have to focus your energy on. Of course, here we are looking for a mechanism to explain lack of clinical diagnosis of pneumonia in children who were not vaccinated. So by looking at options A and B, because of the similarity and the contrast of the two statements, I have a feeling that maybe one of these two may be my correct answer. And between the two, of course, A doesn't seem to be correct because the question says, which of the following mechanisms explains lack of clinical diagnosis in those who were not vaccinated? If I'm not vaccinated, I may not have humoral response. So A is false. Therefore, B seems to be the correct answer. Also, when you look at this question, you see that option B and C, they have phagocytosis by, and of course, that one is a key word which is repeated in two statements. So it tells me that somehow the test maker is interested in the word phagocytosis as well. And that would be an additional support for me if I have no clues about the question to at least make an educated sort of guess and pick up option B. But anyhow, the correct answer is option B. Splin plays an important role in defense against capsulated bacteria within the first few years of life. Lock in this information. Top four capsulated bugs that surface in A. splenic conditions are Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenzae, Neisseria meningitidis, and Salmonella antridotis. The major splenic antibacterial defense function is attributed to macrophages that are plentiful in the red pulp of the spleen. Note that the white pulp includes T cells and B cells. And also note that maternally derived IgG molecules only defend children up until 
six months of age. Well, have this information in the background, let us look at secondary lymphoid tissues. Let's begin with thymus. This is a specialized primary lymphoid organ that is developed from the third pharyngeal pouch and is composed of two identical lobes. Thymus is located in the anterior superior mediastinum in front of the heart and behind the sternum. Thymus is the maturation site for T lymphocytes. It allows for survival of functional T cells and apoptosis of self-reacting T cells. We have covered this before. I'm putting it all together at this point for you. Anatomically, each lobe is divided into cortex and medulla. Cortex is densely packed with thymocytes, whereas medulla is lightly packed with T cells or thymocytes. In mature T cells, the leaf bone marrow enter the thymus via cortex and then rapidly proliferate and rearrange their receptor genes. T cells that recognize self antigens undergo apoptosis. This is the so-called negative selection. Those that bind MAC molecules, one or two, can get positive signal and they are allowed to propagate in the medulla. Mature and competent T cells leave the thymus via postcapillary venules. I want you to note that over 95% of the T cells that reach Thymus never reach to maturity point and they are eliminated. To give you a mnemonic, thymus is developed from the third pouch and T for third, T for thymus, and T for T cells. In contrast, and again, this might have been a good mnemonic also for your DeGeorge syndrome because the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches were not developing in the George syndrome. Just to know the parathyroid is developed from the fourth pouch. And I have said in other places that number four is a good mnemonic for calcium stories because calcium has four letters C, A, plus, plus. Also is related to vitamin D. D is the fourth letter of the alphabet. Also, calcium is known as factor four of coagulation, and also calcium stories goes with the fourth pouch. So four for calcium. Thymus for three. This gives you a good mnemonic. Also, if you recall earlier, we said that the T cells, that they are CD4 and CD8 negative. They are developed, those are progenitor cells, in a bone marrow. Then they migrate to thymus. First, they go to the cortex and then to medulla. So, the earlier letter of the alphabet, letter C, that comes before letter M of the medulla. T cells first enter the cortex, then they mature in the medulla, the later letter of the alphabet, and then they leave the thymus. Again, to orient you once more, in the cortex of the thymus, that's the first location that the T cells arrive from the bone, we're going to have the positive selection. Uh, we're going to have these progenitor cells developed in there that they have CD4 and CD8 proteins on them. Then they go to the medulla, and in the medulla, we have negative selection. This brings us to spleen. And here I'm showing the diagram of the spleen. We have the white pulp in the center and red pulp on the periphery. And then, as you can tell, spleen is a capsulated organ and it has a firm capsule engulfing it. Spleen is a secondary lymphoid organ. It lies relative to the 9th and 11th ribs and in the left hypochondrium and epigastrium between the fundus of the stomach 
and the diaphragm. What are the parts of the spleen? Red pulp. These are isolated parts or venous sinusoids of the spleen that are separated by splenic cords. They retain blood and some macrophages and remove old red blood cells. Marginal zone borders the white and red pulp. White pulp is composed of Malpighian corpuscles that are dispersed throughout the spleen. They include lymphoid follicles that are rich in B cells and periarterial lymphoid sheets or pals that are rich in lymphocytes. A 22-year-old college student with Epstein-Barr infection is hit by a bicycle. He presents with pain in the upper left abdomen and left shoulder and within 30 minutes he becomes confused and dizzy. What is your next step? Management. This story reminds you of rupture of spleen. So your immediate response would be to call 911. Why do I say 911? Because spleen underlies Revs 9 to 11. Functions of a spleen is to filter blood, remove senescent erythrocytes, trap blood-borne pathogens, recycle iron, and hold a reserve of blood that can be unleashed in hemorrhagic shock. I want you to note that half of the body's monocytes lie within the red pulp, and upon migration to inflamed tissues, they turn into dendritic cells and macrophages. B cells and T cells enter the spleen via central arterioles. This brings us to lymph nodes. These are secondary lymphoid organs that act as filters and they are primary migratory sites for antigen presenting cells such as dendritic cells. The cortex of the spleen contains B cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, and they form the primary follicles that are the site of initial B cell proliferation following activation. Secondary follicles are activated, larger follicles that have a denser appearance and contain a germinal center packed with memory B cells and plasma cells. So where do you find activated B cells? Where do you find plasma cells? In the germinal centers. How do you differentiate the germinal centers from the rest of the lymph nodes? They assume in histology a darker coloration. Why do they assume a darker coloration? Because they are packed with more cells. And these cells, they have nucleus. And nuclei of these cells assume a darker color. Afferent lymph vessels enter into the cortex of the lymph nodes. And I want you to note that blood-borne antigens also enter into the cortex of the lymph nodes. B and T cells enter via high endothelial venules and antigen presenting cells via the afferent lymphatics. If the naive B and T cells do not encounter their cognate antigens in their zones, paracortex for the T cells and cortex for the B cells. If the naive B cells they do not encounter their cognitive antigens, they leave the lymph node and go back into circulation, travel to another lymph node, and over there they try to find their cognate antigen. If they don't find it, after staying there for a little while, they go to another lymph node. And if they don't see their cognate antigen, of course, they die. They die off. But if they do, as I've said earlier, they become almost immortal. Paracortex contains the T-cells and dendritic cells, which express the major histocompatibility complexes. This is the site of the initial antigenic interaction. So the antigen 
is passed over to the T cells. From paracortex, the activated T cells now go to cortex and hand in that information to the B cells. And now B cells are going to get activated and we're going to make germinal centers in the cortex. Medulla is lightly populated. However, it has a high titer of the antibodies. From efferent vessels or efferent lymphatics, activated B cells, plasma cells, T cells, and antibodies exit the lymph node. This brings us to mucosa associated lymphoid tissues or malt tissues. In this diagram, I'm showing the lumen of the intestine on top. Then I'm showing the mucosa cells, and I'm showing the Peyer's patches, and I'm showing a mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. I show a dendritic cell, a T cell, and a B cell within the follicles. Also, I'm showing a high endothelial venule in here, and that's the place from which the T cells and B cells enter into these follicles. So mucosa associated lymphoid tissues are non-capsulated subepithelial tissues in the submucosa of gastrointestinal, respiratory, and urogenital tracts. They are either composed of organized tissues such as tonsils, Peyer's patches, or diffuse lymphoid tissues that are distributed in the lamina propria of the intestines. They contain plasma cells, then these plasma cells make secretory, IgA. Major organized malts in the respiratory tract are lingual, palatine, and nasopharyngeal tonsils and adenoids. Malts of the GI are called Peyer's patches. They are prevalent in the small intestine. So which part of the small intestine has the highest number of the Peyer's patches? Jejunum. Ah. Ileum. M cells are specialized cells in the Peyer's patch that have the unique ability to pick up antigens from the intestinal lumen by endocytosis. They act also as antigen presenting cells. So M cells, they act similarly to dendritic cells in the small intestine. Note that macrophages and dendritic cells also enter the malt via high endothelial venules. Let us cover cytotoxic drugs and immunosuppressants. I have a very high yield table for you. I have selected the must-know uh, drugs, and then I'm showing the mechanism, side effects, and indications on the right column. Let's start with azothioprine. This is an anti-metabolite prodrug that is converted in the body to 6-mercaptopurine, which is a purine analog. It is incorporated into DNA and inhibits the DNA synthesis. What does it do? It affects division of the proliferating bone marrow progenitors, including lymphocytes such as B and T cells. Again, these progenitor cells in a bone marrow, they have a higher need for purine, for division. And that's the reason why azothioprine is important in blocking or reducing the number of B and T cells. Then we get to anti-thymocyte globulin, ATG. This is a horse or rabbit-derived anti-thymocyte globulin. It's used for prevention of acute organ rejection and therapy of aplastic anemia. Must know side effect is cytokine release syndrome. Do you expect the ATG to cause serum sickness? Of course you do because this is these days one of the major causes of serum sickness. 
Basiliximab or Simulect is a chimeric murine derived monoclonal interleukin 2 receptor antibody. What is the other name for interleukin 2? CD25. If you've been interested, chimeric is a term that refers to a single organism made from fusing two zygotes, each from a different organism. That is, they minimally include union of two sperms and two ovums. Basiliximab is similar to OKT3 and blocks interleukin binding and T-cell activation. Corticosteroids reduce lymphocytic count and cytokine production by granulocytes. They are mainly used for management of side effects of treatments for immune deficiencies such as IVIG induced anaphylaxis and also for management of cytokine release syndrome. Cyclosporin and tacrolimus, they bind to cyclophilins and calcineurin. I'm going to show you a diagram shortly. They block T-cell activation and they result in inhibition of interleukin-2 synthesis. They are indicated for allogenic organ and transplant rejection. The major side effect is nephrotoxicity that requires mannitol administration. Cyclophosphamide is an alkylating agent that crosslinks the DNA and results in anti-cancer effects. It is used in lymphomas and leukemias, and it suppresses B and T cells. It is used for transplant rejection management as well. Side effects, hemorrhagic cystitis. If you recall from the anti-cancers, the antidote for hemorrhagic cystitis is mesna. Muromonab or OKT3, is a murine-derived monoclonal antibody that binds to CD3. So, in a sense, this is an anti-CD3 antibody. It affects the T-cell signal transduction. It's used for transplant rejection management. Side effects are cytokine release syndrome and nephritic syndrome. So, OKT3. Three of it reminds you of CD3. Then we get to myclophenolate, MMF. This is an immune suppressant which preferentially inhibits the proliferating TMB cells. Indications are for management of allogeneic transplantation. It has similar mechanism of action to azathioprine and inhibits inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase that is required for synthesis of guanosine nucleotides. So it is an anti-purine medication. And as you can tell, T and B cell lymphocytes are more dependent on the synthesis of guanosine nucleotides and they have a higher need for purines in general. So this provides selective effect of myclophenolate on B and T cell suppression. Cyrolimus or rapamycin is an mTOR inhibitor. I'm going to be talking about it shortly. mTOR is a serine threonine protein kinase that regulates cell growth, cell proliferation, cell motility, and cell survival. Cyrolimus inhibits mTOR by associating with its intracellular FKBP12 receptors. Note that unlike tacrolimus, which is a similarly sounding drug, this is not a calcineurin inhibitor. I've given you an important fact to differentiate these two from each other. I mean tacrolimus and cyrolimus. I'm going to be talking about the differences shortly. Just bear with me for now. Here is what I had in mind. Tacrolimus, cyclosporin, and serolimus are all immune suppressant. Cyclosporin and tacrolimus produce their effects via inhibiting the NFAT transcription factors. However, serolimus, despite its name similarity to tacrolimus, 
exerts its effects through the FKBP12 protein? Of course, the first question that we need to answer is, what is NFAT and what role does it play in these immune interactions? I'm going to be referring to this diagram for you. This is a good summary diagram to distinguish among the functions of cyclosporin, tacrolimus, serolimus, and basiliximab. And of course, I also show the T cell receptors, and I'm showing also the interleukin 2 receptors, and they have some relationships to this important diagram that I am showing in here to you. In fact, stands for nuclear factor of activated T cells, is expressed in most immune cells, is a generic term applicable to several transcription factors. And I'm showing a fat person here to remind you of the N fat. These transcription factors are regulated and activated by intracellular calcium signaling that activates calcinorin. I'm showing it in green. Calcinorin is a serine threonine phosphatase. Activated calcinorin dephosphorylates and activates NFAT. So phosphorylated NFAT is inactive. Calcinorin activates it. This activated NFAT now is imported into the nucleus. And when it enters into the nucleus, it causes activation of several immune-related cytokine promoter regions in the nucleus. I want you to note that T cell receptors that I'm showing here in purple on the surface also exert their nuclear effects through the same pathway, through calcinorin, activated NFAT, and activation of promoter genes in the nucleus. And that results in formation of different type of immunologically important cytokines. I want you to note that calmodulin, which is a calcium modulated protein, is a multifunctional intermediary calcium binding sensor and messenger protein that mediates many important cellular processes such as inflammation, metabolism, apoptosis, smooth muscle contraction, intracellular movement, short and long-term memory, and immune responses. This may have nothing to do with this diagram or what I'm talking about, but I want you to know these intracellular mechanisms may have some similarities to each other if you have been interested to know about them. Back to our major concern. Cyrolimus exerts its effect by inhibiting FKBP12. BP stands for binding protein. So FKBP12 means FK binding protein 12. However, I want you to know that when Cyrolimus binds to FKBP to make Cyrolimus FKBP complex, this complex, in contrast to Tacrolimus that I'm showing in this diagram, that inhibits calcinorin. So tacrolimus inhibits FKBP, FKBP inhibits calcinorin. But for serolimus, what we do, we inhibit mTOR. So serolimus exerts the effect through the mTOR, tacrolimus through the calcinorin, locking this information. Therefore, Serolimus inhibits T and B cell division via this mechanism. I want you to note that mTOR exerts its stimulatory effects on lymphocytic propagation via interleukin-2 receptors. So interleukin-2 receptors are also tied up to the mTOR. This function is what basiliximab inhibits. So basiliximab functionally resembles serolimus. How do they resemble each other? Because they both inhibit the mTOR. So locking this information. So the serolimus function in a sense is similar 
to inhibition of interleukin-2 receptor function. So let's summarize. Cyclosporin inhibits cyclophilin. Inhibition of the cyclophilin inhibits calcinorin. Inhibition of the calcinorin will not allow NFAT stimulation and NFAT entry into the nucleus. Tacrolimus inhibits FKBP and as a result inhibits calcinorin. Serolimus inhibits FKBP but exerts its effect through inhibiting the mTOR. This function is similar to basiliximab that works through interleukin to receptors. You might have already asked yourself, what is the cytokine release syndrome? This is also known as cytokine storm. This is a common immediate complication of the use of anti-T cell antibody infusions, such as anti-thymocytes, gelabulin, and muromonab. OKT3 infusion. This may also be a complication of anti-cancer medications such as rituximab, which is a CD20 antibody that is used for treatment of Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Pathogenesis of cytokine release syndrome is based on the fact that this drug binds to T cell receptors. However, Initially, it activates the T-cells before destroying the T-cells. The cytokines released by activated T-cells during the initial phase produce widespread systemic inflammatory response characterized by hypotension and non-infectious pyrexia fever. How do you manage this? You need to use reduced dosages, you need to slow the infusions. You have to use intravenous antihistamines or corticosteroids. What two monoclonal antibodies inhibit interleukin-2 receptors? Interleukin-2 is also known as CD25. To do a short listing for you, to help you to remember these for the exam, one of them is basiliximab, Simolect that is a chimeric murine derivative, as we said before, and the other is daclizumab zinbrito, which is a human derivative monoclonal antibody. They inhibit interleukin-2, and as a result, T-cell activation and division. Let us learn a little bit more and try to memorize the Mosno recombinant biologics I've already talked about them, but at this point, I like to drill you on them so that you don't forget them for your examination. I'm going to perform this function by doing a matching with you. And I have these recombinant biologics here, aldous looking, alpha interferon, beta interferon, gamma interferon, full grass team, operal vikin, peg full grass team, and sargramastin. So I'm going to give you short cases and I want you to match them with these biologicals. The first case. This biological compound is used in the management of T helper one cell mediated autoimmune diseases such as multiple sclerosis and type 1 diabetes. It is indicated for chronic granulomatous disease, severe mycobacterial infections, and mycosis as well. Which one is this biological? This one is a good description that matches gamma interferon. A 25-year-old female patient with a history of recurrent attacks of focal neurological dysfunction that lasts weeks or months at a time is being evaluated for complaint of diplopia vertigo, and localized limb tangling. She claims that her symptoms are worsened with fatigue or exercise. On examination, the eyes of the patient were tilted downwards and laterally. Which of the following biologics would you prescribe for the patient? Of course, a double jump question. 
a young woman, recurrent attacks of neurological dysfunction, and some unique patterns of eye deviation. This one points to multiple sclerosis. So the question is, what would you use for management of multiple sclerosis? The correct answer is beta interferon. So lock in this information. Beta interferon for multiple sclerosis. This biological is used to treat neutropenia. It is also used for patients who have undergone chemotherapy or bone marrow transplantation. Treatment of neutropenia. This is fulgrastin or neutrogen. It is a colony stimulating factor analog, GCSF analog, used to stimulate proliferation and differentiation of granulocytes. It is a pharmaceutical analog of naturally occurring GCSF, granulocyte colony stimulating factor that our bodies produce. Filgrastin, granulocyte colony stimulating factor analog. Why do you use it for? for management of neutropenia. This biologic PrEP is used in the management of malignant melanomas and hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So you have viral infection, hep B and hep C, so you're going to be looking at the interferons for the best answer. The correct answer is alpha interferon. This compound is a recombinant interleukin 11, IL-11. It is a thrombopoietin growth factor that directly stimulates proliferation of hematopoietic stem cells and in particular megakaryocyte progenitor cells and induces megakaryocyte maturation resulting in increased platelet production. It is marketed under the trade name Numega. What is this? You're going to be looking at the last four for the correct match for this one. This is Uprelvikin or Numega, which is a thrombopoietic growth factor. This compound is primarily used for myeloid reconstitution as an immunostimulator after allogenic bone marrow transplantation. It is also used for management of chemotherapy-induced neutropenia. We just covered a similar medication. The correct answer for this one is sergramostin or leucine. It's a recombinant, again, granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor that functions as immunostimulator. It is shown to be effective in management of Crohn's disease and other GI inflammatory disorders as well. This compound is used for treatment of metastatic renal cell cancers and metastatic melanoma. Who is this one? This is Aldous leukine or proleukine, which is a recombinant interleukin-2 product. It stimulates the immune system by encouraging the growth of killer T cells and other cells that attack cancer cells. This recombinant DNA product is used to stimulate bone marrow. It has a half-life of 15 to 80 hours, much longer than other products with similar mechanism of action. So it has a long-lasting effect. This one is pegfulgrastim, and of course pegfulgrastim has peg longer than full grass team that gives you a mnemonic to know that it has a long duration of action. The brand name of it is Nolasta, is a pegylated form of the recombinant human granulocyte colony stimulating factor, analog of full grass team. It serves to stimulate the levels of white blood cells or neutrophils. It has a half life of 15 to 80 hours, that is much longer than the parent filgrastim that has only a half-life of three to four hours. I want you to also note that pegylation is the process of attaching polyethylene glycol, PEG, 
polymer chains to molecules, drugs, therapeutic proteins, or antibody fragments to improve their safety, deliverability, and efficiency. Great job, folks. You finished immunology concepts for your upcoming examinations. Take a good care. Bye-bye.